Welcome back to the Notes in the Garden podcast. I'm Jeff Spickard, the president of Music Garden, and today we'll be talking about marketing, and we have a special guest, Jeremy Evans of Blue Mandolin Marketing and Design here in Greensboro. Actually, yes. you're not here anymore, are you? Are you, Jeremy? Uh, I'm in an undisclosed location in a bunker. Uh, yeah, I can tell by the, uh, <laughs> by the cabin you're in right now, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That is not a, a ladder to the surface. That is a <laughs> that is a long. All right. All right. <laughs> well, again, I have Amy Rucker with me and Ellen Johansson. And before we uh, get into get into this, I just want to give us a quick rundown of what we're going to be talking about. First, you know, is marketing still just marketing during this time of COVID? That's going to be the first question we have. Um, then we're going to get into always remember the basics, always remember the basics when it comes to marketing and then how to convey the value of what we're doing, not only in person, but also online. So let's jump into it. So Jeremy, I'm going to hit you with this first question here. You know, is marketing still just marketing during this time of COVID? Well, the fundamentals of marketing stay the same. They're always the same. Uh, it's the tactics that are going to change. Uh, it's the delivery system, the channels, and that has changed um, due to COVID. Uh, some of our traditional marketing channels are no longer available to us in a viable option, um, at least affordably and effectively. So the, the principles of marketing remain the same. Got it. Got it. So is it still kind of the, what we would consider you know, setting up a plan of smart goals. I think we did a we did a blog post on this a while back. You know, when you talk about smart goals, you're talking about being specific, having things that are measurable, um, things that are attainable, um, things that are relevant, and then things that are time bound. Um, so, is it still kind of in that area of things? It is, and 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 you can apply smart goals to anything in life. You can apply smart goals to a diet. Uh, so in marketing, it, it's it, as with anything else, um, it's good to, to have that in mind so that you have something to achieve and you're understanding, you know, what your goals are. So, yeah, absolutely. Smart goals still work uh, even in the time of COVID. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll put it in the notes in the show here. I'll put, the, I'll put that blog post that we did on smart goals a while back. It's got probably about a year ago, something like that. Um, let's just jump into... Uh, what are the basics when it comes to marketing? You know, one thing that I, that I, that I was thinking about, um, and we were discussing this a little bit uh, kind of pre-show, you know, you're talking about understanding your customer. Um, what, what relevance does that have? I mean, we all have customers. Um, what does understanding them do for us in the marketing sense? Well, it helps us um, spend wisely first of all, and spend our, and that's not only money, but also time. Uh, if you can spend uh, your effort on uh, people that uh, are traditionally uh, use or need your services, then you're going to have a lot more success. So uh, it's often referred to as a shotgun versus a, a rifle effect. And if you can understand your customer uh, well, and you can do that by understanding your current customers uh, through demographics and, and, and geography. Uh, if you can understand that, you can help narrow down the target that you're trying to hit with market. Uh, I think that uh, Amy and Ellen will probably uh, have uh, better anecdotes uh, specifically to a music garden because they've been doing it for so long. Uh, but uh, if the, the more precise you can be, the better off you're going to be and, and the better results you're going to get. Well, Amy, just take that. Is that something that, that your business struggles with? Is that something that you feel like you succeed at? or no, I think, Yeah, I think that this is a really great topic for me personally because I feel like we could do a better job of reaching beyond the people 
who we are, are already reaching or, and have been talking to for quite some time now? How do we expand that? So I guess when I hear you say that, Jeremy, I think, what are the tools for, no, how do you know, you know who, what your demographic is and how do you find those like people that are beyond your, your inner circle? Well, you look at your current customers. Um, you look at the ones that are using your product now. Now, if it was a pioneer pro uh, product or service, it's a little harder to do. But you already have an idea of um, who can use your product. Mm -hmm. But if you look at your current customers, those are obviously the ones that have seen the value in your product and they're taking you up on it. So that's a place to start. And demographics, you're looking at uh, relative age, um, gender, uh, geography. So, you know, obviously for Music Garden, uh, primary demographics are going to be uh, female mothers or mothers uh, with young children. And so uh, you can start to narrow down where uh, using marketing channels you can find them. There's, uh, you guys are fully aware of them. magazines for mothers, uh, blogs for mothers, uh, and, and you can actually find uh, lists out there. Uh, you can you can pay for lists out there that where you can call it's called selects, and you can say I want to find mothers of children between the age of this and this in this geographic area, and they can give you a call list, a, an address list, and sometimes even an email list. So that's one way to do it. Uh, but always understanding your your market's a, a good way uh, rather than say, hey, I want to buy a list of everyone in Greensboro. Well, you're going to get a lot of people that, that don't have children. That's a waste of your money and it will be a waste of your resources. Hmm. Okay, so I think I that's really helpful because yeah. I'm not sure that the average teacher knows how to go about that. So just the fact that you've given some really specific concrete steps that we can take is is super helpful would you suggest then that maybe we could or sh should create a little um questionnaire to ask our previous parents on why they did our programs do you think that would give us a better idea of the main reasons why they picked us over say the soccer team down the street or the um, martial arts around the corner? I think that can help a lot in, in messaging. Uh, you know, marketers, we try to use as much science as we can, but when, we come, when it comes down to it, marketing is a soft science. Uh, but if you can get a, a bell curve <laughs> on about anything, then, then that allows you to, to make some good decisions. I think that if you ask and, you know, um, a normal distribution requires a sample size of 30. So if you can get 30 answers, you could do a bell curve, okay? And, and you could be kind of, um, you could be sure that that answer uh, has some validity to it. However, if you just get five answers, then that could skew the, the results. And so it may not be what everybody in your target audience thinks. Um, so that being said, I think it's helpful in how you message um, or you create your marketing message. So if a teacher, it's like a testimonial from, from a parent and testimonials are very powerful. Uh, and so they can tell you why, yes, and you can go out and tell others, this is why this person did it. And people like to, um, like to see someone else do something first. There's not a whole lot of first adopters out there. That, kind of lead, that leads me into, uh, you know, you're talking about your current clients and even former clients. You know, one thing that Jeremy and I discuss a lot is, as a basic, is following up with your current clients, following up with your with your former clients, you know, especially now during this time, it's, it's, it's always a normal thing to do throughout time. But now, you know, former clients may have moved away and you might be able to pull them into an online class or something like that. Um, you know, and then there's avenues that you can, can do that through obviously email 
is a great way of doing it. Um, here in the in, in Music Garden, I'm sure you all know that we do, we have a pretty robust um, email uh, campaigns uh, where we break things down into target groups. We do mass emailings. Um, how do you feel about that, Jeremy? You think email is a good way to do it? Especially in this um, environment, because people are on their screens a lot now. Um, and if you make something, if you can make a purchase, a click away, uh, it is a lot easier than asking someone to remember what they saw on a billboard or asking someone to remember what they saw on a postcard or asking someone to recall and have to retype or recall a phone number. So uh, definitely in the uh, online environment, uh, email works very well. And I assume you mean multiple email. So that, I, I know I fall into the, I, I call it the teacher hole. Well, I emailed them once. Right. Why didn't they respond two right. weeks ago? Well, right. when I think of my own email, if it isn't that day, I, the first thing I do when I read it is I archive it. It's out of my space. Or you get the other side, side of the parent who says, I just got 2,000 emails. They don't know how to manage their emails, and so they're not reading any of them. Right. Um, so what is the balance here? How many emails? How often do we, the teacher, email them before it becomes annoying? Well, that's a good question because I think it has to do with the recipient. Um, and there's no rule of thumb for marketers. You know, I get an email from some uh, marketing uh, emails that are every day. Yeah. Every day I get an email. Now, do I go and unsubscribe? Um, not always because I'm not, um, I'm not necessarily uh, needing it then, but I might need it later. And part of that is providing value in those emails. Okay. And that value might be a, a, um, a special uh, discount, but it might also be something such as um, uh, one of the things that um, I get daily is Mother Earth News. Okay. And it's kind of a homesteading farming kind of thing, organic farming. And I don't ever throw those away because I might refer back to them. Mm. So if there's some way you can add some value to the emails, when people do finally open them and then they see that value, it's going to lean, mean a lot more when they see you in that inbox. Um, but I, I know, I know you're probably looking for a better answer than that, but um, I would start, you know, start wide and then start narrowing it down and then see where your sweet spot is. Um, see where it is that they start to, um, where they start to click and they, and you start getting more clicks with the email programs. Okay, um, and many of them are free. Uh, with email management programs, they'll tell you how many people clicked, how many people opened, and how many people unsubscribe. So if you start that and your unsubscribes start rising and your click rate is going down, or you know, there's a balance somewhere in between there where you're, lo you're not losing um, people from your list, and you're getting as many clicks as can be expected. And it's trial and error. It really is. There's programs like that. Wow. I have a question. Does yes. it, is it helpful to have a visual? I mean, is it, should it be something colorful that if they do happen to open that email, should it be something eye-catching? Does that help to have either a photo from your studio? And also, my, the other part of that question is, should we be careful to keep our emails succinct, maybe bullet points, short sentences? Because what I'm finding is, is that you, they might read the email, but they don't really read the email. So they're missing, if it's too lengthy, uh, they're just not going through the whole thing. Uh, the answer to all that is yes. And really the, 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 there's two steps to the, the email. It's the open and then the click, right? Right. So the, the open is the toughest, and that's the subject line. So there are lots of things online that talk about how to do a subject line, but you really just need to do something that sound, you know, you think will stand out in an inbox. 
um, sometimes it's provocative. Um, sometimes it's, uh, has to do with, um, you know, a promotion or a special. And even then you have to be careful about what you, some of the words you put in, an, in a uh, subject line because they'll get spammed. They'll get uh, blocked because if you have special or buy or things like that. A lot of that depends on the recipient. And so unfortunately you don't have any control over that. Right. But if you can do something that, that kind of goes, whoa, people say, wow, that's, that's an interesting subject line. Uh, that's step one. Uh, and then step two is what happens after. And yes, colorful, colorful things, but not too much because a lot of people will not load images uh, without having to click on their email and say, load the images. So um, some of that uh, will get blocked. But the next thing is getting them to do the next step, which is click. Anything you can do that's really uh, brief and to the point and gives the call to action. The call to action is, you know, take advantage of this or, you know, please join us. That that kind of thing is important too. Yeah, and I can I can say for us, and some marketing people disagree with me on this, and that's totally fine. Um, I, I tend to take the route of uh, hit them and hit them often because, like especially right now, people are getting so many emails that they may not see one, but they'll see the next one. Um, like here with Music Garden, we. Uh, Leah Young and I come up with a plan and uh, we schedule it out and there's at least one email if not two emails going out a day of course I've got somebody I've hired we do it we do a job you know um, I'm not I'm not necessarily saying a teacher needs to do that um, but you do need to do it often I, I, I believe you know um, you, you can't just send one email and then expect somebody to to react, you know, it's, it's, it's got to take multiple things. That, that kind of leads me into a, a question here of about, um, you know, we're talking about email, but what about text? What about phone? You know, this is another, another realm of, of touching base with your current customers and old customers. Um, I'll go with, I'll go with Ellen first. Um, is, is text a way that you communicate with your families? Hi. Or is phone a better option? I'm going to say, yeah, texting seems to be a very quick way. I mean, they, they get it immediately. It's in their face, and then either they're going to respond or they're going to forget it. So it's, it's a not as um, savable. It's more of like a flash kind of feeling. I'm, I'm, I'm two ways about it. I like to use text to... Hey, I'm waiting here in the in the room. Are you going to show up? Or I'm, um, you, you know, uh, it's 15 minutes. Just make sure you got your books, kind of thing. i I've never thought of using it to. By the way, you're going to join us this session. Um. I don't know. That's. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead, Amy. Well, I I I, I totally appreciate what you're saying. You have to decide how you're using it. I do all those things that you just said too, Ellen, but also I have used Messenger, Facebook Messenger, to contact people I don't have their cell phone, um, but I know that they've been interested in my program. So I've used that to reach out to a, a certain mom and then pull her in to, to my program. And also just yesterday, I solved a problem by creating a text chat group with current incoming cycle of seasons families that I, we just could not settle on our time and it was just so complicated and i thought i need to let these moms just like get in here and get this figured out so i pulled them all into this chat and they right away they they responded and they were confirming yeah this is me and so i was putting everybody's names on it so they had names not just phone numbers and i said okay here's where we are and here's where we're trying to go and they worked it out and we were done in a matter of minutes. And by email, I had been waiting for, I don't know, two weeks, over two weeks, waiting by email to get them to respond. I even gave them a when to meet, yeah. uh, which as you might know, is one of the easiest ways to find a common time is that when to meet. 
And they wouldn't even do that. So this so chat brought it all face, home. That in their face text right. got you to where you wanted to go. Exactly. It's, a, it's an interesting tool. Um, yeah, and I, here I'm, I'm saying I'm not sure if it works, but the other day I've, I've been talking about doing online jazz classes, but never really committed. And guess what? The teacher, Facebook Messenger, well, are you on? I was like, oh my gosh, I totally forgot about it. Geez, I'm going to do it right now. And I, I did it right then and there. So here he used that very thing very effectively on me. So why not turn it around on those parents that I know are on Facebook or texting? You know, get off the toilet. Let's get going here. Yeah. Um, they might be on the toilet with their phone. You never know. But <laughs> get them. Because, yeah, there's so much... <laughs> There's so much going on on that phone. I, it reminds me of the Star Trek, you know, beam me up, Scotty. You know, it's always an immediate thing, and I think that's probably the best marketing tool is getting on their phone. So, yeah, I, I think I've got to open up to this possibility. Well, well what about it, Jeremy? I mean, it's, obviously, Ellen just brought in another element of how the phone is used nowadays. When I think about the phone, I still think, think about calling somebody, you know. Um, in that aspect, just calling someone is is the phone a dead option or is it still a good option just to touch base by phone with someone well i think it can be um you know and i think that you can you can do that um if you have a lot more to say than what could be in a text but yeah. you know texting is very interesting in that texting allows the right of refusal but you know it's getting there right yeah now but you have to do it sparingly because um, as Ellen pointed out, uh, texting can be very intimate, right? So um, you, you have to do it sparingly. It, it's, it's almost um, someone's letting you within their, in, within their bubble. So I think that you can, you can do a group text uh, for things such as, hey, we're starting a new class, you know. But, you know, marketing's about doing more than one thing at once, and it all points to the same thing. It's specifically on social media, but, um, you know, so send out that email or those three emails over a two week period and do a text, but just don't, don't over text it would be my. So my maybe advice. perhaps an, a starting email, maybe a repeat of the email three or four days in, uh, maybe another repeat three or four days in, and then a text at that point, hey, we're getting close to the date. Yes. Um, and, you know, you can say in case you haven't seen my email, hmm. you know, Instead of, did you read we've my got email? a class starting and I'm just, you know, I'm doing this as a favor to you. Right. Uh, um, this is a walked you know, into their friendship zone. Hey, right. Hi, right. I'm yeah. It's just, you know. I, I know you're so busy with right, right. emails. I just wanted to make sure that you heard. Yeah. That we are starting in, a, in, in two days. Right. And, uh, I'd love to hear from you either way. And if, if uh, you know, if a parent um, responds or, or a customer responds and says, oh, that sounds great. I'm sorry. I missed your email, blah, 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 blah. And they want to start that conversation. That's great. You can text them as much as you want. They have allowed that. Um, otherwise, they can ignore it, which, you know, I tend to do on some texts or at least save it for later. Um, or, uh, you know, and, and very, if, if you do it sparingly, they won't block you, but what you don't want to do is get a parent cell phone blocking you, uh, cause that would be a nightmare. Um, so that, that's, um, that's my advice on text, which, which is very interesting, but I would only do it. I would not look at the services that do texting, uh, to target audiences. Mm. It's a little, it's a little, um, Strange. What we've done, it, I mean, it works in certain situations. For example, we had a client that had uh, a goodies shop around Christmas, and it was at the Randolph Mall. And um, like you guys would know what that is, uh, it was at the local mall. <laughs> and uh, we did a text within a radius of the mall okay. that said, hey, come by and you can get a free edible you know, while, you know, while you're shopping. And That's so it hit. Yeah. yeah. You can ignore yeah. that or, Hey, I'm going to the mall. Right. right. I got this text. Cool. Mm -hmm. Look, 
where's that goodie? Right. And there were a lot, you know, it reached a lot of people that were already in the mall. Yeah. Um, you know, it's like right across from Santa. And that was very successful. Uh, but um, for, for a, a business like Music Garden, I'm, I'm not sure it would be effective. Um, yeah. I, but, I think that intimacy issue is I interesting. Only I, I was thinking I had just purchased an Apple product. And um, not only did I get multiple emails that it was on its way, but then I got a text saying that it had hit my door. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of creeped out by that. Like, are you looking at me? How did you know this? There are yeah. some people who find that the phone is, is a more, um, it's on my body. It's part mm -hmm. of me. I, you, you weren't invited in. Even though I did give them my, obviously I gave them my cell phone number, so I did give them permission, but it doesn't mean I give you permission right. to actually do that. So right. I think we have to respect that parent line um, and decide, all right, this parent, yeah, I've, I've done multiple texting with them. They seem comfortable. I can give them a reminder versus it's like a cold call. You know, suddenly out of the blue, hi, I'm the friendly music yeah. teacher around the corner. I want you to join my class. Who are you? Yeah. Yeah. We don't want that feeling. Then they're going to go, you know, to their friends in this woman's kind of creepy. So, yeah, texting, even the, the Facebook messaging seems a little step back. Like, it's like a part of Facebook. So getting Absolutely. that personal, not personal messenger kind of made me feel special but I didn't feel like they could come at me I chose to go on to messenger to to read that and then oh yeah okay I get it yeah move on right and I feel like Facebook is a um, it's a different it's a different place than than your person you know you're logging in you're checking it out but you know there's lots of people out there and you know whether you answer a text or not they they may or may not um, uh, or an instant message, but this is this is personal, right? So um, I think I think Ellen said it perfectly. It's it's, it's a part of my body, and yeah. it's very intimate. Okay, well I will I won't judge Ellen on buying another Apple product, but uh, um, yeah. <laughs> but okay, that, that covers kind of touching base with people, current current customers, former customers, how we can touch base with them what we feel like, you know, email is an excellent way to do it. Texting, use it kind of sparingly. Phone call is still an option, especially if you know the person and you have a little more to say than what you would just say in a text or something like that. So what about the website? You know, to, to me, uh, a very basic thing other than following up with your folks is keeping your website current. Um, so Jeremy, um, Websites very important to us as Music Garden as a co as a co company, to our studios they each have websites. Um, what kind of suggestions would you make as far as them keeping it current? You know, as far as what kind of classes they're doing now, things like that. Well, you certainly want to keep your website current if you're giving online classes or classes at all. And if you have a website, uh, you want to keep it current. You know, Music Dar Garden does a blog. Uh, what? And, and there's a couple of reasons for that. One is to be fresh and give your, your audience um, what they're looking for. They're not looking for old content. The second is, is the search engines really like new content. Mm. So, you know, we, the Internet has been around for a, a long time now. And there are websites, and I know we've all seen them, there are websites out there that have been out there forever and have never changed. Whether it's on auto renew or whatever the hosting, you know, the, whatever these people are doing, they're forgetting about the websites. So, um, keeping things relevant, Google and the search bots go out and they find stuff that's new, and that gives them some relevance. Uh, and it and it has to do with their um, ranking algorithms. So, keeping things relevant uh, and new uh, is important to both the search engines, but also important to your customers. So, so two set, two two minutes. Okay, Ellen, Ellen and Amy. Let's go with Amy first. Um, have you have you updated your website currently? Letting them know what offerings you're doing right now, what the cost is, all that good stuff. 
Yes, but this is through Center for Young Musicians, so we actually have a, you know, our, our person in place to, who's paid to do that. So it makes it really easy, but I do help with the content. And so I'm, I'm feeding to him, um, this is what my new classes are. This is a little blurb you can put with it. Here's the link to sign up. Here's the link to the materials, blah, blah, blah. And he takes all that and puts that on. And our, our website always starts with what's coming up. And it has four blocks of like the next coming attractions, whether it's a ukulele camp or whatever it happens to be. And then you can scroll down, you can click on the calendar. Um, there's a register now button that's, you know, always, always available. And so, yeah, we, we update pretty much daily on that website. So my personal website, I don't use for marketing or for music garden or anything like this, more like a, an online portfolio, but as far as Center for Young Musicians, yes. And so you guys can take a look at that. Anybody can go to it, um, centerforyoungmusicians.org and see what that looks like. But I think it's a, a really effective way to, to keep it fresh. What about you, Ellen? I think you use, you actually use one of the, the Music Garden websites, right? I've been using the Music Garden website since its inception. Yeah. And um, I'm always updating it. And the things that cause me to update it is usually desperation. Um, or I get the phone call from someone, so what are you doing this fall? And it's like, oh yeah, all right. And boom, I'm on. And, and you can get on the back end of that website really easily and go right to your home page and I usually look and go oh wait a minute that's saying spring I've got to change that and so I try to keep it fresh and it only takes like five or ten minutes to say you know the fall is coming it's time to sign up or the last I think I did it yesterday I put it as big as possible fresh new online classes because that's the mode I'm doing this fall mm -hmm. And then underneath, I had a, I, and I've got to reduce it. I got too wordy on why you would want to join an online class with a 14 month older. Um, and I even, I think, put underneath a sample online class video that was new um, that I had recorded. So I'm always looking on getting that front page going. Uh, keep fixing that, keep adding those keywords music, early childhood. Dancing, drumming, fun, um, fall, you know, all, I, I keep trying to repeat them. Um, the stuff that doesn't change would be my bio. The programs, of course, change. I click on what's great about the Music Garden uh, website that you can use is that you can keep all your information there. You don't have to keep redoing it. You just click, okay, I'm doing that class, that class, that class, that class, click, click, click check that it's correct, change some of the costs, done. Oh, and then you, then you got to put the timing. And that's the only thing I've had trouble this, win this winter is I'm just staying starting in September. I used to be more specific, but with the schools being so uncertain, mm -hmm. yeah, that's going to change in the next week or two, but they all know it's going to start after September 15th. So that's a yeah. good way to do that. I like that. Okay. Yeah. So you keep it current. That's good. That's good. Yeah. But um, when I can, when you can, when you can, well, that, you know, it, it's, it's super important. You know, we're, we're, we're talking about it, you know, with, not to scold you, but um, well, yeah. And that's the important say. thing. I remember talking to a gardener and I, I asked her, when's the best time to transplant perennials? And she said, when you have time to do it. <laughs> and I thought, that is so true for everything. <laughs> Stop feeling guilty. I should have updated that a month ago. <clears throat> you didn't. Update it now. Yeah, exactly. You got the time. You need the money. You need the students. Go. Do yeah. it. Yeah. It might be another case, too, where you have a parent who is really savvy in these kinds of things, like websites, and you might be able to work out a deal with that parent. I think that Leilani Miranda does something similar with somebody in her program and, and ends up doing a lot of her tech stuff for her. So something else to keep in mind so that we don't always have to be the ones doing it, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. That's a good point. And that, that'll probably come up a little bit here with the next, with the next subject is, uh, you know, of, our, of my top three things talking about basic stuff is social media. Um, that, that dreaded, dreaded combination of words that 
we all love to hear. Social media, um, as much trouble as it can cause, it, uh, it's a huge outlet of where people are. Um, Jeremy, is there any way we could ever get, get away from social media? Probably not. Well, I think it will evolve. It, it already has. Um, it's evolved to, um, you know, to mobile devices with um, Instagram. And so I, I think that it, it may not be called social media in 20 years, but there'll be something. Yeah. Uh, they decided, they figured out how to make money. Uh, you know, it used to be same thing with Google. Um, it used to be that uh, Google was free and everybody wondered how they made money. And they mm, really weren't yeah, until yeah. They, they came up with Google ads. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, you know, we as, we as marketers, when we were developing websites, it used to be we could get on the top of Google pretty easily just by knowing how to program a website. But that's not the case anymore. Um, although Google denies it, uh, if you're, you've got to be playing out there in, in those ads. But uh, social media is, is a great way uh, to point a lot of different arrows at your um, call to action, okay? So, uh, and, and that also helps to drive traffic to your website. So if everything's pointing at your website, and Google sees that everything's pointing at your website, Google says, wow, well, this website must be relevant. I'm going to rank it, you know, higher because there's a lot of people pointing to it. And that's, an, you know, another reason that it works really well, getting someone to put the link to your, your website on their website, a reciprocal link. Um, the more traffic that goes to a website, the more relevant that Google um, thinks it is. So um, social media is... There's a lot of clutter, and especially in a, an election year, there's a lot of stuff that you probably don't want to see or, or maybe a lot of stuff you want to see. Uh, but, but what that does is, is makes it a little bit more difficult to cut through the clutter. Mm -hmm. And uh, But the thing about social media is also viral marketing. So, you know, the shares and the likes and that kind of stuff, anytime that um, and, and, and like people will be together. So again, your target, your target audience will probably have a lot of similar people in their social media um, circle. And so when they like something or share it or whatever, it's going out to, to your target audience. So social media is very valuable. Um, but um, I, I have a question about the, the share and all that. I notice that on Facebook now, you, I, in fact, I do this all the time. When I now pop on Facebook, the first thing I do is look at notifications. So these are people I know. The second thing I do is I go to the groups because those are the people I've already shown interest in, although I'm getting a little tired of the same stuff. But still, my habit is to go there, there. It's, it's getting rare and rare that I'm going to the home to just flip through the news feed. If that's my behavior, I'm sure there's, that's happening elsewhere. And then I notice in the Facebook, of course, to the right are all the little sponsored ads, which I honestly don't look at, never have, never will. I've done it, I did it once and got fried, so I'm, I'm, I like go out of my way to not do that. So how do we get that new perspective young person, of which probably we have no common interests. I'm not really interested in what a 20-something parent, how do I get into that group in a way that I'm not going to either sound like I'm promoting myself, which I, of course, want to, or how do I, how do I, beside, obviously, I, do, I have to spend money, don't I? And then the next question is, how much? It's like per day. Is it ten dollars a day, twenty dollars a day, one dollar a day? Do I even know if I'm reaching the right audience? So that's where I'm. I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm rambling. But that's how I feel on Facebook. We start to ramble yeah. because it seems so vast. Well, and you're not alone, even from a marketer standpoint. I mean, um, you know, I, I think that 
the advice I give um, is, you know, just try something and see how it works and um, adjust accordingly. You, know, the, you were talking about the, the ads down the side. Right. So you do an ad, like they, they say, do a Facebook ad, you know, promote or boost your, boost your home Facebook page, you know. You could boost this. And so I've done that a few times. I throw money at it. Boom. Okay, I'm going to do it for, I don't know, X amount of days. I get nothing in return. I mean, I'd, nothing. I'm not even sure what happened. All I know is that I did pay for that. So I did it. And now I'm plan B, which for me is, well, I'm not going to do that again. Well, and... and uh, I'll talk. I'll talk about it from from a music garden standpoint, um, because in a lot of ways, you do think like that. Um, the one thing you have to get past is just because you use Facebook a certain way or you use social media a certain way does not mean that other people use it differently or use it the same way you use it. Um, we've been doing social media for years now. And it's one of our driving thing for, for inquiries. And it's obviously I've, I've got a guy that I've got a wonderful guy named Scott Dixon, who, uh, who takes care of our social media campaign. Um, and we do a combination of just posting, just regular posting all the time. And some people say, do it once a day, do it once a week. My greatest advice is, is whatever you decide to do, you do it consistently and you do it well. Um, that means whatever you post needs to be engaging. It needs to be something of value and it needs to be a link that's going to take them to your website that will hopefully sell them something. Um, and we don't, as music teachers, as music garden, we don't like the word sell. And honestly, we need to get over it. <laughs> we are here to sell somebody something because somebody out there is trying to sell them something different. So the mistake that we are as um, Facebook is that we're not selling ourselves. We're, we're trying to be liked, but we got to go to. Yeah. I, 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 picture, I, I, hey, do you want more of this in your life? Go click here. And that takes them to your website. You got to get that website click on the Facebook share every single time correct yeah you you want you want to drive them to the website the, the purpose of social media for me is to drive people to my website right website or the facebook group or whatever you call that thing website to the website so you want to get you're you're trying to get put all your energy and all these social medias to get them back to website exactly the, where they can give you money website yeah. because that's where they register they yes, don't on Facebook. Got it. I think that's been my mistake, is that I, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of hanging out there. Hey, I'm here. And that's fine, and you can still give things of value and send them back to the, to the website, but you've got to ask for the business. Yeah, yeah. You have to remind people that, that you do this for a living and, and that... So maybe, maybe for the, the new teachers because I'm thinking on the mu music garden teachers, uh, Facebook, that the words, what we're, we'll, that's another podcast is what exactly do we write? I want, I want to make sure we, we make a note that we will do a podcast on maybe templates or uh, a cooperative. This week, we're all going to focus on this because obviously we're not all going after the same communities, although some may be, uh, but let maybe this week we'll focus on a Facebook and this week we'll focus on an email and next and that if we have that template then the new teacher or even the veteran teacher can say okay I don't have to reinvent this it's done I just need to cut paste click yeah. get on and then I don't have that niggling feeling of I gee I wonder why no one's calling me maybe I need to do mm -hmm. something well, and, and part of that really comes down to your area, too, because what, uh, what we may write for something, somebody here in Greensboro, or somebody's going to write for somebody in New York, or somebody's yeah. going to write for somewhere, somebody's going to write for somebody in California is going to be slightly different. So 
adaptable. You can, you, you're going to have to adapt it to, to some extent, you know. Maybe even a bulletproof. Um, exactly. your, this week, yeah. make sure it says these three things. <laughs> these three things. Yeah. These three things. And whatever they could be like uh, classes start now or uh, this is the value you're going to get this week. We're highlighting this value mm -hmm. or uh, missing music lately, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. And to kind of go back to what I was saying is it, I'm kind of unashamed. I'm unashamed about promoting the product. Um, I feel it is something that's extremely valuable. I know for my children, it's extremely valuable. For my family, it's extremely valuable. Um, for society as a whole, I think it's extremely valuable. So I, I have no problem <laughs> telling people about it or, or marketing it. Um, and, and, and really, your website is something you've invested a lot of money into. So it should be the place that you want people to focus on. So social media should drive it to your, to your website and make it as easy as possible for somebody to do a one click. Like if they're clicking from Facebook, whatever page that you have them clicking from Facebook should be the direct page that's going to give them all the information they need, plus be able to register or purchase whatever you're selling from that page. It shouldn't be a two-click process. It shouldn't be a three-click. And it needs to be as close to a one-click process that you can have. You know that at least that's what that that's my experience. Is that is that how you feel, Jeremy, about that too? Oh, absolutely. Um, each additional click is a chance for them to to go off in another direction. Um, I think that uh, Amy mentioned that she puts a little blurb about things on the homepage when she, when she talks about the classes. And, and that's good because that, you know, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't necessarily make them drink. And so what you want to do is you want to, really, I, I consider a website um, having a, a pathway. And you can have conversion goals in Google Analytics, and I'm not sure if you guys use that, but conversion goals are, you know, our goal is where we want them to be, and that's the purchase. Uh, and the, you know, what the pathway is to get to that is very important, and it needs to be very short. So um, if you can create a, a landing page that, that where uh, we call a landing page where a class, specific, specific class can be signed up for right then and there, that's ideal. And not necessarily uh, having competing classes on the same page. Just having one thing, one thing for them to do. Uh, that that is going to be more effective than having something to distract them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, like if uh, like for Music Art Incorporate, you know, when we're advertising webinars on social media, we're advertising a single webinar. We're not advertising. Um, family music and cycles and uh, music makers at home in the same post. We're, we're narrowing it down to one of those categories. So we're doing family music for toddlers. That's going to be the one we're going to post about. That's the information we're going to put in the, in the message. That's the link we're going to put in there. And then that's also the targeting that we're going to do because we're going to focus on parents of a certain age group. We're going to focus on parents that have children of a certain age. There's no need for us to put a child that's, they have kids that are 10 years old. It doesn't fit the, it doesn't fit the category, you know? Um, so we're, it's very targeted as to what we're, what we're thinking about. And you can do a lot of this in Facebook ads. You can do a lot of it in, uh, if you just boost a post. Um, and there's a whole lot of argument between, uh, social media people as to what's better. Is it better to run an ad, which is actually something that's behind the scenes in Facebook? And those are the things that are showing up on the side panel, you know, as to what, what a boosted post is. A boosted post would usually show up as something that's sponsored. It'd actually be in your news feed. Um, those are boosted posts. Um, and to me, they're both, this is just coming from me. I'm not a marketing expert by any stretch of the imagination. Um, I just have a lot of hands-on experience. To me, they work, they work in concert together. Um, I don't think one takes away from the other, and I think both of them do a very adequate job of driving traffic to the site and driving, some, driving traffic to somebody who clicks on it and actually registers without us even ever having a conversation with them before. Um, 
which is what you're, what you're looking for, you know. Um, we were talking about smart girls earlier, and, and you know, I, this all seems overwhelming because it, it really is like the marketing mix, right? It's you do all of the above, but you don't have to do all of the above every day. You don't have to do all of the above every week. So if you can set, set down and put together a schedule um, where you say, okay, on Mondays, I'm going to do a Facebook post. On Tuesdays, I'm going to do an e-blast. On Wednesdays, I'm going to you know, do a text or, or something of that nature. Then you can keep to it and you can be very prolific. Uh, and, and another thing I wanted to mention. Yes, exactly. And, and another thing that I wanted to mention was Jeff talks about splitting things up. So there's one specific goal or one specific purchase uh, target that also gives you a lot of other content to do on those things. Cause if you're just sending them to your homepage, that gets boring. So send them what we call a deep link um, and a direct link to the page where they actually make uh, the purchase and make that page attractive. Uh, don't make it a shopping cart page. That's nothing but pricing. Um, have a little bit of color on it. Not too much, but have a little bit of color, have a little bit of text uh, and kind of reinforce. So let me, let me get more specific. Let's say I want to get um, the demographic of parents with four and five year olds joining my music makers class on Monday afternoon. So I'm going to go to Facebook, do a quick Class is starting, maybe a picture of, say, the front cover of the Music Makers at Home in the World with, um, and then a link directly to, not my home page, but directly, say, to the program description so they can get more information. And then on that page, there might be a click that says register now. So I, I've got it down to two clicks versus home page, find the class, register. That's three clicks. Mm -hmm. I can't do one click because if I go to registration, it doesn't, my registration thing doesn't really give the information they need to register. So I, I see a two-click process. It, it, is that basically? Really, you know, when you talk about going to a sh having to go to a shopping cart to check out, yeah. Things do get to be more than than two clicks away. But yes, the, the general idea is have that button that says, I do want this. Um, and make that know, as I, simple as possible for them to get there. Yes. So that means going back to the website and making sure that register now is at every, you know, if I'm going to click them there, i got to make sure that that's there on the top. They don't have to scroll to it. It's right. there. Um, don't make them hunt for it. Yeah. Huh. Hadn't thought of it from that point of view. I'm suddenly seeing that this is not just some nebulous place that I need to do, but that I actually have a goal, which is to get them to my website to register. That's my overall smart goal. It's specific. Absolutely. Yeah, and, that, and that's just talking about Facebook. I mean, we can't leave Instagram out of the out of the picture. You know, Instagram right. is, Instagram and, and Facebook are owned by the same people, so um, they work together. Um, and there's certain different goals with them. Can you um, put Instagram? A is a, Instagram is a very photo friendly right. place. Um, so if you're going to be sharing nice images, Instagram is a good place to go. It's also, from what I understand, the the social media that is actually growing among younger people. And when I, when I say younger people, I don't mean I'm, I'm almost 50. So younger people to me are in their twenties. So well, um, parents of young children. Yeah. Parents of young children. That, that's, and that's, that's who we're after. Exactly. Um, and one thing to go back to the whole website thing, talking about updating it and find somebody who's techie to do it. You don't, you don't necessarily have to do all this yourself, you know, uh, we posted, Amy was good enough to post a, um, a survey on, uh, on our teacher Facebook page. And one of the, one of the answers the, the one of the teachers uh, gave us was, you know, they see that Instagram is actually starting to boost for them. So now they're going to find somebody in their studio who's, who's good with tech 
and they're going to give a half tuition. They're going to give a tuition. They're going to make some kind of arrangement with that, that parent to, uh, to help boost that specific channel, you know? Um, so it's very targeted, you know, it's very tar. I, I see this on a rise. So I'm going to act on it now and see if I can, can benefit from it. Um, is that something, Amy, have you ever done that before in the past? Is that something you, I know right now with the center for creative, uh, for the center, you, you ha y'all have marketing people who do this stuff. Um, but is it something you've done in the past with, uh, on your own? I, ha I have done it to an extent on my own, but have done it more since coming to Pittsburgh, but um, it's, it's very doable. And I think that I agree that the younger, the young parents, they have an approach to Instagram that I still don't feel like I fully, you know, can, can claim just, there are a lot of different options as far as having people you can swipe to get more information or, or tell them to go to the bio to get the link. Um, those kinds of things or also effects and different things that you can do and poll quick polls that you can do. Uh, there are a lot of things like that that I'm not savvy with, but I know that they are. I know my daughter is. <laughs> yeah. And I think that it, it's a great idea to, um, you know, to get parents to help you. And the question is, is uh, you know, how do, how do you find the ones that really do know the, the, um, the outlet like Instagram? So maybe you can say at um, a class or in some communicate, you can say, hey, I need a little help with Instagram if anybody knows anything about it. And that per somebody volunteers and says, this is how you do it. You say, would you like a, you know, would you like a, a, a discount on your, on your tuition if you can help me, you know, help me do this? Mm -hmm. And I think that's how you find the ones that are really savvy about it. But, it, but it's important to stick to, to reiterate that this is a younger demographic and, and Facebook is, a, is an older demographic. Now, Music Garden goes after Facebook because we're after teachers. Um, and so that's an older demographic also. Uh, but going after students, you're really going after, um, you know, parents of young children. And uh, so you want to go with uh, the newest and, and uh, newest thing. And, you know, I think that uh, it's important to point out that it, you can Google just about anything and find out how to do it half, half well. Okay. I, I changed something out of my truck the other day. I would have never attempted that if I didn't Google it and get three videos that showed me exactly how to do it. So, um, you know, don't be, don't be afraid to go and look and get instruction on how to do it. There are plenty of, of uh, millennials out there that want to tell you how to do this stuff. Mm. Um, so, yeah. Hey, I have a quick question. Is there still, what's the going thought about time and day, best time and day to post? Is there still is there a general still? rule for that right now? In, in my experience right now, there, there doesn't really seem to be a best time or day. Um, like with Facebook in general, we post constantly throughout the day. Um, we, it used to be you would limit yourself to one post a day and you would target a time. Um, now we do three, four, sometimes five posts on Facebook within a day. And it's just because the news feed is so overwhelmed that you have to keep, keep putting message out there. We don't do the same message all that time. We have five different messages. Um, but uh, then we'll recycle, you know, during the week, um, some of those same messages, you know. Um, but yeah, you, because of the news feed and how much stuff is just coming on there, you have to continually post. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It used um, to be for e blasts, we would try to do it um, right before lunch or right after lunch, because that's when people typically, you know, check their personal stuff before they do what they're going to do for lunch. Uh, and then in the evenings, because people have social media in the evenings. Um, and that, that used to, um, used to work very well. And it may still, if people are, are being good about continuing their work at home <laughs> and then doing that before and after lunch. But, um, just right. Uh, if you gotta stay, you gotta stay on top of the conversation, um, any time of day and not on a consistent time of day because keep in mind that people are we are creatures of habit 
So one day at two o'clock, you may hit me because I'm always checking my, my social media at two o'clock. But at 10 o'clock, Jeff might be checking his. So by doing it at different times, you're hitting different um, audiences. Um, and you want to kind of keep it consistent in time of day sometimes so that you're getting the repeat that we like in marketing. So we're here, I'm hearing two, two actions when I'm doing this work. I have to create the content, but I don't have to create it and immediately throw it out there. I can create the content and hold on to it and Absolutely. then put it out there at various times and kind of experiment with it. It could be um, on Thursdays, it could be, uh, so I may actually in my own schedule put, I'm going to do media work on Thursday. Uh, during the week, I might create the content, but it's on Thursday that I'm going to throw it out there. So I almost have a goal here. I have a set time that, and if I haven't done anything all week, well, then I'm going to spend a little more time that day doing it. And also, I heard that you can recycle stuff. So once you've got stuff, take it and do it again. Don't be afraid to do it again. It's always been my fear is I don't want to tell them again. Well, yeah, you know, we know we got to tell them six to eight times before it finally goes, oh, yeah, right. Okay. Six to eight is, is a lot more than one. Absolutely. Absolutely. Rinse and repeat. Right. Yeah. Well, we're, this, is, this, is, this is a good session. We're, we're covering a lot of ground. We're, we're going pretty long. So um, I'm going to skip a, a little bit of what we had planned and get into, you know, our, our last – kind of big topic, which is really conveying the value of what uh, what we do as Music Garden. Um, and, uh, you know, when we're talking about online against in person, you know, a lot of people think, well, you just can't do that. You're not going to get the same value by doing it online that I get in person. Um, and I'm not sure if that's a legit argument or not, um, to be quite honest. I'm a big fan of honesty. Um, I, I, I still see value in what we do. Um, <laughs> yeah, I hear the, the pregnant pause. Uh, yeah. Ah, uh, the pregnant pause. I don't think any of us like uncomfortable silences because, hey, you know, they're uncomfortable. But we always try to find a graceful and sometimes funny way to get through them. Join us for the next episode of the Notes in the Garden podcast while we discuss the value of Music Garden even in the online world. <laughs>